to our first uh, Art and Culture series. Uh, this is a new series put on by uh, the three of us, me, Marty, and Robert, um, as part of like the Common Area Maintenance Studio. And the whole purpose of this is kind of like, we really felt like we were missing like a place to talk about art and like the cultural influences within art, like whether or not like people kind of like are aware they exist. Oh. <laughs> and um, we, our other hope with the seminars and especially like the readings we provide are to develop some kind of like shared language and also to provide like a safe environment for us to have these types of conversations. Um, yeah, and so um, we'll have two presenters today, myself and Carrie Morgan, who's um, coming in through Zoom. And after that, we'll have a discussion round table. And yeah, and like we said before, since this is our first time doing this session, please just like let us know if there's like any kinks, um, if anyone online, if you can't hear us, or something like that, just reach out. Okay. Uh, so we're kicking off these art and culture series with the topic color. Um, we really hope you enjoyed the pre-readings that came with the invite. Uh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, we tried our best to kind of curate the readings and like keep them relatively short and kind of like accessible. Uh, but it was quite a challenge. I think like one of the reasons why we are so excited to start with color is that it's a very approachable topic, but it's also like a very big topic, which is like why it's been a little bit like hard. And I think um, as you've seen in the reading, there's like a lot of different angles we can kind of all look at this. There's a bit on like access to color, like whether or not you have the pigments, um, there's also just kind of like the cultural meaning, uh, the fact that if I say like the word red, whether like the red I'm thinking in my head is likely not the same red that you're thinking in your head. And also just like the application of color, like how artists use color in their work. Um, so I really hope you enjoyed those and do take a look at the extended bibli bibliography if you have some time. There's like lots of really cool, great resources in there as well. Um, yeah, and I think with that, I'll get started and then Carrie Morgan will go after me. Yeah. Um, all right, so um, my name is Monica <laughs> and um, I'm a self-taught artist. I've been practicing since around 2018. And through art, I really enjoy exploring my heritage and kind of questioning these topics of culture. Uh, these days I'm transitioning to more Chinese brush painting, like what you see here and kind of like taking my own like modern spin on top of that. Um, but what I first started working with was alcohol inks. And so alcohol ink, I feel like is a fairly like new medium. Uh, it's gained a lot of popularity in the last several years. I think a lot of it I've seen, like, especially on Instagram and social media and whatnot. And it's less like, like, I feel like there's less, because it has less history, there's like a lot more resources online rather than say like in books and stuff. So the way I ended up looking up resources for it was just kind of like on Google or Instagram and stuff like that. So what I found was that a lot of artists were using the same color palettes. Like there were a lot of blues and purples and these kind of like greens complementing them. And they really dominated the style of the artwork. And like, these are some examples of just like when I Googled like alcohol ink art, like all of the examples showed up, it looked roughly like what you see on the left. And then Canva, this presentation tool actually like extracts colors out of paintings. And I was like, oh, like, do you want to continue using these greens and blues and purples and stuff like that, like to even like create this presentation? I thought that was really interesting because it was just like, in a way like affirming those colors. And so like something about this didn't quite resonate with me. Like I felt like it, I was like missing something out of it. And um, 
going through the readings, like one of the things you talk about is access, right? So just to kind of clear that up, I looked into like what the alcohol ink manufacturers, like what colors do they provide people? So one of those brands is Jacquard. Um, as you can see, their color palette is fairly limited, uh, but there's like definitely way more colors than blue or purple or green. Um, there's quite a few other colors. One of the other brands, which is I think much more established is Copic. And they, uh, so like one of the techniques people use well, in the one that I use is I would just take these marker refills and use that to paint with. And as you can see, there's like a lot, <laughs> a lot more colors, but definitely not just like the ones that um, were in that picture. So kind of like looping back into the readings, um, I had broken them down myself into access, um, individual perception, like that red versus like my red versus your red kind of thing. And then cultural meaning as in like what a group of people have assigned um, that like what a group of people assigned like the meaning to a certain color um, as well as just like application. So, you know, looking back at this again, we know it's not access because we just saw that there were a lot of other pigments. Um, since it's like a group of people and not just one artist, it's not necessarily like an individual person, it's like a group's concept, a group's like choice to have that color preference. And so that's kind of why I like just kind of had this epiphany maybe that like, oh, people are choosing this for like one reason or another. But that led me to question like, well, what do I want to choose? Like, do I want to keep going with this color palette? And like, what, what does like, what's a color palette that resonates better with me? And so, yeah, so this is kind of where um, I started taking my own spin on things. I want to ask the question, like, what would Chinese American alcohol or ink look like? And one of the first takes I did was kind of using these, like, celebratory, like, holiday colors. Um, so in Chinese culture, we use a lot of reds and golds, especially for holidays. Um, red signifies, like, kind of fortune and luck and, like, just these really good feelings. And gold, and yeah, gold signifies kind of like wealth and prosperity. And so just kind of this idea that like, oh, good things are going to happen, like, like fortuitous kind of things are going to happen. Um, and I applied those colors into my work and came up with these pieces. And for me, it's just like something about it kind of resonated more deeply. And I found that part like just really satisfying. Another spin I took on it was drawing inspiration from ceramic ware. So this is actually a photo of a plate I found at the Asian Art Museum. And I took out the oranges and the greens to create these abstract pieces. And something that I thought was really interesting was when I showed them to a lot of other people, um, many people were like, oh, this reminds me of nasturtium. And nasturtium, I feel like, or not, I feel, but nasturtium is actually native to the Americas um, and I like has, be, is known for like how easy it is to grow, especially if you're a beginner gardener. And so I thought that was a really interesting way of like someone else kind of like adding their cultural layer on top of it by interpreting this abstract work in that way. And the last piece I have for you is just this blue and white one that was also inspired by ceramic ware. Just kind of taking a look at like taking porcelain and like making it abstract and having those like blues on the white. So um, after kind of seeing this journey that, or after presenting this journey I've taken on like choosing my own colors, I want to ask all of you, like what colors do you feel like are more accessible to you or less accessible? Like whether that's like a cultural thing or like conceptually or something else. 
And if you're a visual artist, where does your palette come from? Do you know what has influenced it? And like, was it one you developed intentionally? And you don't have to answer those right now, but just things to ponder on um, until we get to the discussion portion. Okay, so um, that's all I have for you. Uh, do you have any questions about my presentation specifically before we move on to Curie's? We'll just have like a few minutes to clear anything up, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And I'll say for the in-person participants, uh, feel free to raise a hand. And then for the Zoom participants as well, if you can use the hand raise feature, uh, I should be able to see that and, and, and you can talk. Um, I really was interested in kind of your discussion on there's more YouTube and like self-learning availability with um, water, like alcohol markers, and was just kind of wondering if you ran across any material that kind of thought about this thinking too, like other artists that had spoken on this or were pursuing different types of palettes and kind of the first Google searches that come up and all of that. Mm. I think in my journey of doing alcohol inks and I did it for roughly like three years, um, I hadn't come across anything like that, which is why I was like, hmm, like, I feel like this art is just kind of like stuck in this unspoken, like, we're going to do this color palette, everyone. <laughs> and so um, I think that's what really drove me to like push my concept so hard. Like I wanted to put something out there and I haven't found anyone else yet who's doing that, um, but I'd be really excited if I did. <laughs> Cool. Um, Carrie, do you want to take over? Sure, I can do that. Uh, share my screen. It's one time before. <laughs> there we go. Okay, you can all see this? Yep. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Carrie Morgan. My Nishka name is Kalajak. I come from the house of Quiskine. Um, my crest is the wolf crest and my house crest is the white grizzly bear. And as a First Nations person, um, traditionally that is how we always, um, how we always present ourselves. And when we say hello to a group of people, you always say who you are and what your background is. So I am mainly a Northwest Coast indigenous fine artist. Um, I also do, a lot of other artwork and have since childhood, but this is my main focus for my career. Um, I also went to school here in Terrace, British Columbia, Canada. Um, I'm not from here, but I'm from the next town over. And uh, so Northwest Coast, British Columbia is where I've always grown up in. And I went to school and studied under three master carvers and learned how to carve traditionally First Nations fine art and also how to design properly um, our traditional art as well. Um, so in my presentation, you will notice that I spell color differently than you guys, <laughs> but I also may have made my slides a little bit more as like a kind of an instructor kind of style because that is my background, but also at the same time, I'm going to be doing a big project with the Nishka Museum in the next two years here about actually getting grants for um, earthing traditional pigments that we used um, in our artifacts and also making traditional tools. So a lot of it is information that I'm going to be using for myself in the future. Um, so Monica and I actually met one time and it was really awesome. And uh, we, we actually discussed like our similarities in culture and um, kind of coming up in like slightly removed from our traditional cultures, but wanting to get to know our traditional cultures and our best way of knowing our traditional cultures is through our art and then we started talking about color and color perception and then monica decided that we would have a big discussion with a lot of people because it's something that we're really interested in and i figured and she figured that everyone else would be pretty interested in this as well and as she described that a lot of people actually don't talk about this so it was pretty interesting on its own that no one really discusses this kind of stuff. So I'm glad that we start this now because it's pretty interesting actually. 
So I really enjoy the whole brain side of everything too, not just like the feeling of how all the colors actually make you feel like nostalgia and stuff. But I personally think it's interesting when you think about your personal perception of color and each person views everything in life through your own brain and like all your senses, emotions, situations, interactions. And it's kind of like you view it through your own perception using your own experiences like a mirror. And with color, it's the same way. And we literally have no way of testing if we can see the same as the other person, like the same red or orange. It's um, something that like a lot of people don't even really think about, but it's something that's interesting when you start actually diving into the science of your own brain. And then when we're talking about culture and the perception of color, um, each, each group makes up their own language revolving around colors. So for most cultures, they develop language for colors starting with white and black and then red because that's very visible in the natural environment like blood, dirt, flowers, berries. So it's very vibrant in comparison to a lot of other colors that might be around in the earthy environment. Um, some cultures actually categorize it even differently than we do, like our very regular uses of light and dark and opaque and saturation and warm and cold, whereas some, some of them use like something like fresh and dry. And then some use mainly certain things like a type of tree or berry as the way that they describe that color instead of an actual red or orange. So with that knowledge of how each of us see the world and color individually, it starts to make a whole concept of how we perceive color more multidimensional and interesting. And through mental perception, cultural terminology and personal emotions connected to specific shades, we process everything entirely uniquely. So when it comes to Northwest coast access of minerals and the pigments that we used, it was always through the minerals we had within our environment. And the main ones would be black and red. And then we had a blue green color. And the main ones I have up on the screen, charcoal and magnetite, and there's a number of other ones, but we've had like thousands of years of different uses of minerals and also binding agents. So there's variations. And the really interesting ones would be when we started using um, vermilion, which is this bright red right here beside the darker red, which is the red ochre. And I actually personally like using the red ochre, the red iron oxide kind of color because it's earthy. And people in my, um, in my culture, in my community have been using this bright red still in a lot of their paintings and carvings, even though I personally am drawn to that more earthy dark tone. And it was the first pigment that was coming over through trade in Canada from the fur traders coming back from China in 1725. That was the very first color traded. And then we have the uh, Vivianite, which is that greenish kind of um, stone down there. And it's an interesting one because it actually comes out clear and then through oxidization, it actually turns to a different shade of green to blue. And that's what we would use all the time as our more blue colors in our paintings. And then Ricketts Blue, which was available as a commercial laundry bluing agent um, is what they started using in 1830. And then not as common in the Northwest Coast was the green colors and the yellow and the white, which I have down there in the left, which would be the um, Caledoniate and yellow ochre and the gypsum. And the yellow ochre is actually a variant of the red ochre. So process and use, once again, like through thousands of years of actual using and um, actually like BC itself, even including down in Washington, it, in the Northwest, 
uh, coast of the Pacific here is a big space. So a lot of different mountains and a lot of different types of earth to get your pigments or your binding agents from. But the most common ones would be either water or dried salmon eggs. And we would use the dried salmon eggs wrapped in the cedar bark to catch the egg membranes. And then they would chew the salmon eggs and, into the painting dish and then mix the pigments in to make it a right consistency. And I have these images from the Burke Museum there in Seattle. And I actually did a virtual tour with them last week, looking at traditional painting tools and pigments there as well. So our use for these colors, and black would be the usually mainly used for the primary. So as you can see there in my images, it would be like the first thing drawn and it would always be interconnected. And then red would be the secondary and use kind of like a little bit of an add on to it. And then sometimes we would use blue or green as a tertiary and like a third element into it, kind of making more design. And then here in the Northwest coast, we don't use a lot of yellow or white and it's very rare, but it's more common in the South. So our purpose and our significance of it is usually always just connection to our spirituality and around our land and how we're connected. And then most of the time it would be depicting the lineage and wealth and status of the owner of the object. So nowadays an artist, you're known for your art. Like if I do a painting, people know that it's my painting, but in our tradition, back in the day, if I did a painting, my chief, if I did it for my chief to show that he has a sign of wealth, that would actually be known by him. But in our community, instead of me having to go out and make a name for myself, and then me also having to um, make sure that I can make enough money to have my house and make enough money just in my career in general, they actually as a community would always take care of their artists. Like that was an actual job within the community itself. So for red ochre, the significance of it is always painted on sacred and ceremonial objects and then body decoration. And then shamans would cover the patient's body in a healing ceremony with the red ochre. And sometimes it would be burned as sacrifice to the ancestors in hopes for like good hunting, good fishing or good food gathering. And then it always had trade value along with uh, salmon and eagle feathers and eagle down. And then Vivianite would be used by shamans mainly because it was a transformative material up in the corner. You can see that it goes from that clear crystal to a dark greenish blue color. And then it would also be painted on sacred or ceremonial objects and painted on armor, like that war helmet down below. And then it's usually, and this is something where we know a lot, is that it would be a sign of high status in a chief because then you would have the ability to actually have that pigment with you. So you would be able to have either the, the wealth to trade for that pigment or have the land resources to have that pigment and have it painted on maybe the front of your big house, your long house, and then people would know that you are a very wealthy family, a very wealthy chief. So in traditional Northwest Coast art, those were the colors. And then this was my use of earthy kind of pigments in my artwork. And I also used a lot of more traditional style within the, the painting itself and the way that I designed it. And this looks very, I, don't, I know that you guys have a lot of um, similar art down in Seattle. So you can probably see that it looks relatively traditional in its color and concept. Um, and I don't like to use bright colors, except for recently I tried to decide to make myself go out of my comfort zone and use a lot more colors. When it comes to my carvings, I actually don't like to use a lot of colors. I do have that poster up here where I use black and that was the extent of it because it, it also had copper eyes. And I felt like if I added more color, it would take away from the carving itself. And that's how I feel with all my carvings that I leave unpainted. I think that the grain of the wood 
usually has so much color and design within it that I really enjoy. And also every time I cut the wood, then it also shows a lot of depth. So even though my people have specific colors and it has a lot of meaning for me personally, I just like the art without the color. And so this is my newer kind of modern take on my First Nations art. So it's got a lot of non-traditional colors in there, or it's more non-traditional styles of painting. You can see that there is the one that's painted in the negative instead of the positive. And then up in the right corner, there's one that doesn't have a single thin line, the tertiary line, which is not traditional. It's almost a rule to always do those thin lines, but I decided to leave this one out because I wanted the grains to show. And then down in the bottom right corner, there's no gap between the U shapes and then the uh, primary. And so this is very non-traditional. It's kind of my modern take almost on like block style of Northwest coast. So it's very different and it's almost when I made it, I almost felt like, am I pushing the boundary too much? Is this something that is allowed? So Northwest Coast art um, was outlawed until 1951. And then in 1960s, it had a resurgence. And a lot of the people who taught me how to do my art started making a actual market for it and started teaching other people. So I don't know where it would be now if it was allowed to adapt and evolve like all other art forms, if it would be more common to use a lot of different colors, if it would be more common to use our traditional art within all these other types of art that myself and all other Northwest Coast artists actually enjoy as well and feel very drawn to. It's kind of an interesting point where we are now, but with the colors, we all love our traditional colors, but we live in a modern time now and we're all kind of incorporating all of our favorite colors within our traditional art as well. So that was my presentation. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Does anyone have any questions for me specifically on my presentation? Did you notice I have Monica's painting in the background? <laughs> I'm a big fan. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Oh. We have a hand raised from Rowan. So Rowan, go ahead and unmute. Okay. Hi. Um, I was actually, I was curious about, um, you said it was outlawed until the 1950s. Do you know of any artists that they maybe were rebelling in some way, like painting in Western style, but maybe like tweaking it a little bit, a little bit? I'm curious about that. Um, to the best of my knowledge, um, they were rebellious in still secretly doing the art because it still survived. It was outlawed for over a hundred years until it was finally not against the law to do the art, but we still have that knowledge. So some people were doing it still. Um, we lost a lot of more traditional ways within the pigments and the making mm. the traditional tools. But um, I don't know if anyone was doing it really in um, like European style but I definitely know that they were doing it within secret and not showing other people because they knew it wasn't allowed. And that's the only reason we still know a lot about how to do our traditional art now. Oh okay, yeah, that was my other question was how, uh, how did your teachers learn? But you answered that basically, so. Yeah. <laughs> that's really From cool. people who did know, and then my teachers opened up a school because they also realized that it was something that needed to be shared because it was a dying art because we weren't allowed to do it. So they made sure that they opened up the school to show a lot of indigenous people how to do our art correctly because there's a lot of rules within it as well. So I'm very fortunate to have that. <laughs> uh, and I have one last question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you said on your sculptures, you like to leave it without paint. Um, do you feel like um, 
it goes beyond personal taste. Like maybe there's something in your generation that makes you you're more drawn to the natural grain of the wood. That's a good question. Um, it might be. Um, it might also just be me. Um, I know in First Nations art, I know almost everyone. It's a small community for us. There is a lot of people, but I, I know most of them. And most people like to do at least one color or two colors, but I really, I think it's just me. <laughs> okay. I, think, I think I just like the minimalist and like, I really like to make sure the cuts are deep enough that you can get the shadows. The shadow is almost like another color. So once you add more onto it, then you're kind of getting an overload of information and it doesn't make everything look as smooth and cohesive. That's just my take on why, because I don't think other people do it as much as I do. All right. Thank you so much. No problem. Thanks for the questions. Of course. All right. Is that everything? Do you want me to let you have the screen back? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So uh -huh. now we're going to take a quick 10 minute break to kind of mull over the questions and the presentations. And then we're going to open it up into kind of a round table. Format. Well, there's no table, so we're going to be in sort of a ring of chairs, so we can set up the camera so the people who are here virtually can still kind of be included virtually. Um, and then we're going to alternate between an in-person and virtual person kind of giving their response to the questions, or you're more than welcome to have kind of a free-form answer. It doesn't need to be directly responding to these questions. We only ask that it includes both color and culture and not one or the other. Uh, so yeah. Break time. Break time.